Listeners, readers, welcome to the Foxed page, where we dive deep into the very best books. You'll come away with a richer understanding of the text at hand, all while learning to read everything a little better. I'm Kimberly Ford, one-time adjunct professor at Berkeley, best-selling author, and PhD in literature. Today, I'm really psyched to dive into Yellowface. This is a book that I read uh, right when it very first came out last year, and I really loved it. It was super provocative and really interesting to me in lots of different ways, which we will get into. Um, but then I left my copy uh, somewhere, and then I really couldn't find it. And I just found it, and I was so psyched because it had some good notes in it, and it's going to be a great lecture today couple of quick housekeeping things before we dive in. The first is that if you have not already checked out uh, and are not following the uh, Foxed Page Instagram, you're going to want to do that. Partly because there's some good little trailers and sort of little uh, teasers about upcoming lectures or whatever is being posted on the podcast, but there are also occasional uh, weekend giveaways where I post something, you make a comment, and we draw from the names of the people who've commented, and then if we draw your name, we send you a very cool reader's gift package. Um, and these are pretty deluxe, guys. This is like, there's usually a book. Most of the time, there's some sort of book involved, um, but you know, they'll maybe be like uh, uh, some chocolate or um, some earplugs to put in if you are uh, with your family, for example, and trying to read and everyone's bugging you, um, or maybe some hand cream to make sure you're turning those pages uh, well. So check that out. The other thing is, if you want a more immersive experience, for example, if you want to see um, this like weird looking kind of claret colored uh, jumper thingy, it's not even a jumper, it's like a vest, but it actually looks like it has these weird wings. It is something that I in fact knitted and uh, it was too big, so I put it in the washer. And those of you who knit know that um, if you put something that is wool into the washer uh, and you don't watch it really carefully, probably even if you do, it just felts up into just like a little, basically like a pot holder. So if you're interested in what this pot holder that I'm wearing looks like, get yourself over to the YouTube channel uh, where you can watch the lecture and I will splice in different visuals. So you will not only be hearing my voice, but you'll see different uh, images as we are moving along. Sounds like audiences are also enjoying that. The last thing I wanna mention is that most of the time these lectures, uh, when they are just a straight up lecture, when it's not like an enriched read or an old favorite, they follow a pretty standard format, which is in the beginning sort of half hour, we, we, there aren't any real spoilers. So I will talk usually about why I want you to read the book, uh, what the author's life was all about, and then we'll dive into things like the title and uh, the cover art and usually the first sort of paragraph. So um, if you're tempted to uh, check out one of these lectures and you haven't finished the book, do not worry. Or if you haven't, uh, you know, maybe you're deciding whether or not you're interested in reading something, you can always listen to the first part. Um, in the last hour or so, there are very well maybe some spoilers. So just wanting to make sure everybody understands the general structure of these lectures. Okay. Now, I'm so excited to dive into Yellowface. So this is a book by R.F. Quang, Rebecca F. Quang, um, and we're going to get to we're going to get to this, um, the, the way that she is uh, sort of packaging herself on the front here. We're going to discuss that in a minute. Um, but it's a book that uh, got a lot of buzz. It was on a lot of those sort of lists of the best books of 2023. And I really, really uh, agree with that assessment. In part, it's because the prose is just interesting. It's a real page turner. I mean, this is a book that is very, very well written, but also the plot and the, the sort of premises upon which it sits are so interesting. So um, I want you all to read it in part because this is one of our kind of very few examples of an unreliable narrator and an unlikable narrator. Some of you may have listened to uh, the lecture that I gave on uh, the guest. I'm forgetting the woman's name right now who wrote that. Um, but it was a, a lot of people had been saying that that book, like Emma Klein, that that book was like uh, Joan Didion and like uh, Eve Babbitts, who are writers that I love. And um, one of the distinctions I was making and one of my sort of dissatisfactions with the guest was how thoroughly uh, sort of unlikable the narrator is. And to be clear, I do not have to like a narrator. In fact, um, a lot of the fiction that I like, uh, for example, Lolita, that is not a likable narrator. And yet that book is one of my very, very favorites. 
I love television where people are behaving badly. I love stories of people who just make horrible decisions. I even like them if they're like being mean to other people. I think it's because generally I try not to do that. So there's kind of this interest in like, what would life be like if you were just a terrible person? So I am not someone who needs a likable narrator. And in fact, in this book, um, I really enjoyed what I think is actually a, a pretty thoroughly unlikable narrator. Although we do have a lot of sympathy and we're gonna look at exactly how Quang pulls that off. I also wanna look at this book because it is such an interesting um, sort of case study in, uh, in identity politics. I think that's right, identity, uh, I wanted to say, I wrote down on my thing, the politics of identity. And then I was like, I think that's identity politics. But I'm also now wondering if maybe that has turned into like a code word for something terrible. If it has, let's just say um, the identity of, or the politics of identity. So there's a lot of questions about who gets to tell stories and who has a right to tell certain stories. There are a lot of questions about racism in this book. And it does this very cool thing where it kind of doubles back on itself, which we are going to talk about. So all of that makes it really intriguing and also made for an excellent uh, deep dive because there is so much to this really well-written, really intriguing book. For those of you who like an agenda, we are, I just covered why it is I think that you should read this book. We are then going to just dip quickly into the biography of like this ridiculously accomplished uh, young woman named Rebecca Quang. Then we're going to dive in. And when we dive in, we'll look at the title, we'll look at the cover art, and we will look at the first paragraph, the first couple of pages, which really, um, really tell us a lot even on our initial reading, but they were really delightful to go back and look at after we have, uh, after I've finished the novel, just because there, it's you're sort of uh, the the nuances that you have gained throughout the novel really color the opening very differently uh, when you have that information. Uh, then we're going to talk about narrative voice. So. It's very important this is in first person and we are going to dive into all the ways that first person really is the perfect person uh, to have as a, a an unlikable and sort of unreliable uh, narrator. We're then gonna talk about humor. I found so many parts of this book so funny in a very, very dark way, of course, but I really think that, that Quang has this incredible ability to talk about things that are really heavy and important and very, very dark, but with this levity that is so, so good and it runs throughout, it's sort of, there's always kind of this low key levity and then occasionally it just is like downright hilarious. Um, then we're gonna talk about horror. Little did I know that this is like basically um, a horror book. I mean, not really, but like there's a definite uh, horror element. And I really liked it. And I was kind of sucked in and kind of like confused in the best of ways. So we're gonna look at that. Then we're going to look at, uh, at some, some politics of identity and then the close of the novel. So I wanna dive into, uh, very briefly into her biography. Um, it, she was born in 1996 and uh, in China and emigrated with her family when she was four years old. And uh, she went on to go to Georgetown and then got a master's in a, an MPhil, which is a master's in philosophy, which is basically a master's degree uh, at Cambridge, and also got an MSci, which is, I believe, in it's a master's of science. It's uh, another British master's degree. So she had two British master's degrees. Um, one was uh, in, in history, and I believe the other one, I think they're both maybe in history. She's really someone who um, is very, very bright and is very, very, uh, um, you know, she's very sort of capable of doing all these sorts of different things. She um, now, at last, um, last we heard about her, she is getting a PhD at Yale in East Asian language and literature. This is also a young woman whose literary accolades are ridiculous. Like she's literally been, um, she had a whole a trilogy, I believe, called The Poppy Wars that I think is either like fantasy, it must be fantasy or sci-fi or speculative fiction, whatever. Um, those are not exactly the same categories, but those are genres that are not really my favorite. Um, but she won all sorts of, or she was nominated for all sorts of those awards, like the Hugo Award and the Nebula Award, that might be the same award. That's how checked out I am of that whole scene. Um, but she's very, very successful in terms of literature. Yellowface was a real departure, but it has been hugely successful. Um, my copy tells us that it was in Reese's uh, book club. And I'll just say very briefly, people like Reese, obviously Oprah, 
these um, women who have these incredible, um, like, uh, just well uh, curated and really well thought through and, and really vibrant book clubs, I am so happy about them. I mean, they really have done so, so much for reading. I mean, you know, all hail Oprah, man, that woman, she's very powerful and boy, has she done a lot for reading. So um, what we have here with a Rebecca Kwong is a very, very smart person who is really, really doing amazing things in literature. I was really interested in uh, the acknowledgments. I always read those as part of my literary sleuthing. And she says at the beginning of the acknowledgments, Yellowface is in large part a horror story about loneliness in a fiercely competitive industry. So you could read that and you could start making some bad assumptions about um, how autobiographically we should read this novel. And the rest of the acknowledgments very happily tell us, in fact, that she has had a, a very warm and a very uh, collegial uh, experience in the publishing industry. She talked a lot about laughing. There was some whole thing about laughter in, in her acknowledgments. So I, I'm, I'm very happy to know that her experience has not been like June's or like Athena's. So. That is all very good. That is our biography uh, portion. Okay, we are going to now dive into the text. So um, I, the cover is really, I really think it is very effective. This is a cover that is bold and it really speaks volumes, especially once you um, are done with the book. It really speaks volumes about some of the issues that are that are sort of brought up in the book. Um, it says a lot about stereotyping. It says a lot about, um, you know, it says a lot about racism. It says a lot about uh, the politics of identity. It's just very, very effective. I like how simple and bold and stripped down it is. And I like the fact that we're really only having three colors here. We've got the yellow, the black, and the white. And there is something about things, you know, the black and white nature of it, um, meaning even sort of metaphorically, like that things are not black and white. In this case, they are really uh, colored by this idea of racism. So I also really like um, on the on the spine of the book, we have this like little eyes are repeated in a way that I think is excellent. It's very, um, it's very sneaky. And it's, I think, a very good detail. I like um, the Time Magazine blurb on my copy says razor sharp, which I agree with. I really like that very much. Of course, we have um, the number one New York Times bestselling author because she, her other uh, series, Poppy Wars, uh, the po Poppy War, the Poppy Wars, um, that was uh, very, very successful in terms of the New York Times bestseller. Again, we have Reese's Book Club. Good job, Reese. And here we have just in very, very bold letters, the title. So this idea of yellow face, it's very much like black face. Um, the idea that, that um, you know, specifically to uh, theater or to movie making or to costuming yourself or disguises, this idea of a Caucasian person, a white person, that's important, as sort of um, making themselves up, which is very, um, very germane here because we have June who is essentially uh, doing exactly that when she passes off uh, this work. And, and very specifically, at one point, when they change her name to Juniper Song, um, she doesn't outright say that she is Asian or mixed race, but she certainly lets that assumption be made, which is really uh, unethical. So we also, I really think the emphasis on the eyes there is very good. So it's, you know, there are lots of different um, elements that allow us to be racist. But with um, with Asian people, the, the difference with the eyes is one that is most sort of uh, the one that people kind of point to most. So we do have that focus on the eyes. But what's excellent, in my opinion, is the way that they're giving side eye here. I mean, we've really got like this, we've got really like a, a side eye thing happening, where the um, it, there's a lot of suspicion. And there's also a lot of vulnerability. Like this is both these eyes are both giving like a I don't trust you, like, what are you up to? I'm suspicious of you thing. But they're also giving a like, uh-oh, like is someone following me? So it's really, really, I think, an excellent cover. So now we are going to go on and talk about the narrative voice. Narrative voice or narrative stance or your narrator or point of view, all of those speak to who is telling the story and in what voice. So in this case, it is June who is telling the story and she is telling it in the first person. 
Whenever you have a first person narrator, it's always interesting to ask yourself, why this person and why now? And in this case, it's actually um, sort of even more interesting because we have this, this uh, really sort of unreliable slash unlikable narrator. Again, those are not the same thing, uh, but in this case, I think we have some sympathy for her. And in the beginning, the first 75 pages, I didn't really, like, I wasn't sure if we were supposed to like her or not, which is such a good sign because that means that it's not too heavy handed. And it means that we do have sympathy for her and that we, ha and we're going to look at why. And we're really kind of um, bought in to the story in ways that are very effective. And of course, make it all the more significant when she uh, turns out to be kind of awful. So it's very important that this is told from the perspective of I, which is the only thing that first person means. So first person is, I did this, I did that. So we have June who is speaking to her own story. So that is the person who is speaking. And usually you ask the question, who is speaking and why now? And the why now is because she is at a point in her fictional career made up by uh, Rebecca Kwong here where you, um, you know, she thinks, according to the end, that things are not over for her, but she's been through this crazy saga. And so what the reason why she's telling us the story now is because we are at the end of this chapter, no pun intended, in her life, June has taken the manuscript of a good friend and has passed it off as her own. So it makes sense that June would be telling us this story because she has all of the information, all the kind of inside information. And she's very good about sort of um, giving us backstory, about explaining things about Athena, um, which, I mean, we have to take with a little grain of salt, again, because she ends up being somewhat unreliable. But also, um, you know, she, she gets to withhold information and then give us information. So it's a very uh, deft choice on the part of uh, Rebecca Kwong to, to use the first person narration here. I recently got in a little trouble um, during a class that I was teaching in my local bookstore for not having read the jacket copy. And lots of times I don't, um, although I should certainly to see what it is people, uh, you know, what it is the, the, the packaging people are pulling out of the narrative. Um, I got in some trouble because there was something in there that seemed like a revelation that I was finding when in fact it was written right in the jacket copy. But I like this jacket copy. It says right here, white lies, dark humor, deadly consequences. So I really like that. I mean, the idea of white lies just really speaks to the way that things are so sort of color coded for us. Um, and, and just we're sort of steeped in these kinds of ideas of identifying things as um, as dark or light or uh, black or white. There's a lot of nuance here with color. And I also like the fact that they're pointing out uh, the humor in the book. So we're going to um, skip right on through here. I have to say, um, most of you know you, um, you people who've known the Fox page for a while know that I like to do a lot of literary sleuthing and I like to do a lot of, um, you know, I'm a sort of a groupie. I like to figure out what the dedication is. This is to Eric and Jeanette. Um, neither of those seem to be her uh, love interest, who I think that she is thanking at the end of the acknowledgments. Um, I have to say, didn't dig that deeply because she's 27 years old. Um, well, I think, yes, she's 27 years old. And um, I just was like, how interesting, you know, could her life be? Wait, that's so mean. And that is not true. What I mean by that is that uh, I think we have some very salient information about her and, and the story that she has written is incredible. And I want to know the details of her literary career and, and um, you know, her academic stuff, because that seems very germane. It seems less germane to me uh, to know who uh, Eric and Jeanette are. So didn't, didn't do any sleuthing there. Then um, we're going to dive in to uh, the very first couple of pages, spe specifically this first paragraph. Chapter one. The night I watch Athena Lou die, we're celebrating her TV deal with Netflix. Off the bat, for this story to make sense, you should know two things about Athena. First, she has everything. A multi-book deal straight out of college at a major publishing house, an MFA from the one writing workshop everyone's heard of, a resume of prestigious artist residencies, and a history of award nominations longer than my grocery list. At 27, she's published three novels, each one a successively bigger hit. For Athena, the Netflix deal was not a life-changing event, just another feather in her cap, one of the side perks of the road to literary stardom she's been hurtling down towards graduation. Second, perhaps as a consequence of the first, she has almost no friends. 
This is such a strong start. And there's some things we're going to pull out. We're going to talk more in depth soon about the narrative voice, but it is very important that it is being told in the first person. So we have this first person narrator, June, here, who is, is obviously the one telling the story. And a few of the things that are happening in this very first paragraph are really important in terms of uh, how, how things play out through the novel. So one of them is that right from the start, we're getting this Athena and I, we're getting this kind of um, conflation of the two of them. The night I watch Athena Lou die, we're celebrating. So it's the two of them are together, um, both in terms of the we, the mention of we at that point, but also because they are physically together um, and, and they're celebrating her. So you're starting out um, from this place where the, the two young women are, you know, geographically together, uh, but 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 also um, Athena is dying. So that is a very very big very big deal. So then um, this idea then then very quickly we get to this second sentence, which is really important. Off the bat, for this story to make sense, you should know two things about Athena. So this idea of um, the I and you. So anytime you have a first person narrator, there is an assumption of a you. So you have like, I am the narrator and I am talking to a you. So like as soon as there's an I, as soon as it's first person, there's kind of an assumed you who is listening. So there's a certain intimacy to first person narration that's very effective because whether or not there's direct address, like whether or not the narrator is saying you, um, there is kind of an assumed address to a second person. A reader is assumed to be you. I am telling you a story. In this case, right away, we have this direct address. And we also, it's the direct address is in the context of this idea of like, if this story is going to make sense, you have to understand something. So right at the beginning, there's kind of this bid for collusion between the two, you know, between us, the reader, and, or between I, me, the reader, and the I here, who is uh, the, the June of the narration. So you have this idea right away of this I and you, and there's a certain gap, obviously, in a, in a division, but we are kind of sucked right in, and she's going to help us understand. Of course, once we've read the book, this idea of like, in order for this to make sense to you, you have to understand some things about Athena. You have this sense that she's like holding your hand, and she's going to tell you the important stuff. But there's also enormous power with that. She is going to pick the two things and she's going to give us her perspective on them, her point of view. So when she says things like, this Netflix deal is not a life changer for her, we, I mean, who's to say? You know, maybe for Athena, that's like the very biggest deal. So, and this idea of not having any friends, I mean, you know, that is June's perspective on the whole thing. And maybe Athena doesn't, maybe she does. Um, but but the, we have to be, um, we're not, we're not very suspicious at the very beginning, but a smart reader uh, would be a little suspicious. Um, quick note on that idea, a first person narrator who is this emphatic and, and is sounds smart and sounds sane, um, and, and sounds like they're really wanting to confide in us, the, the kind of default setting on the part of the reader is to assume that this person is sympathetic, at least with me. So most people who are writing a novel want the protagonist to be sympathetic. They want you to like the main character because you want to be invested in the story. And it's hard to invest in a story and keep turning pages if you really don't like the main character. In the beginning of the story, you're giving June the benefit of the doubt because our default is to assume that the writer is going to write about someone who is you know kind and thoughtful and compassionate uh, because those are the things we want to believe uh, you know anyone would be so we have this idea then of um, the two things that we need to know about Athena is a that she has everything and b that she has no friends it does turn out, in fact, that June is not someone who has a lot of friends, and June, um, as we know soon, is not someone who also has a lot of literary success. Also, by the way, we know at this point that she's 20, 27, at 27. I love the fact that Rebecca Kwong at this point is also 27. She was 26 when the book came out, but like, I mean, almost, well, she's now probably 27 or she's turning 27 soon. So you, in some ways, you really could read this as autobiographical. And there is a lot of meta stuff that is happening in this book. Meta simply meaning um, when something is sort of conscious of itself or its own uh, production or its own uh, origins. So when the novel is talking about 
itself, when the narrator's talking about writing this novel, this actual thing we're holding in our hands, that's kind of a meta thing. And here we have this very slippery thing going on between Rebecca Kwong and this Athena person, because we're given a lot of data on the front that makes them sound awfully uh, familiar. And frankly, I'm just gonna talk about this now. When we have this cover, Yellow Face, and the, the, the name of the writer, R.F. Kwong, is, you know, we, we make an assumption as a reader that this person is Asian. And that is a bad assumption. I mean, it, it, you know, they may have married into an Asian family. We don't know. I also think it's really interesting that Rebecca F. Kwong gives her initials, R.F., not Rebecca on the front, because I think she's also playing with our idea of gender. When you have an initial, there's no way to make, well, and these days it's harder and harder, but there's no way to know if this is a, a woman who's writing or a man. So there's a lot of um, sort of hiding on the cover, meaning RF is hiding, you know, potentially the gender of this writer, although the picture in the back very clearly, you know, shows that she is a woman, which I mean, now why is the binary? You know, now I'm like doing a whole thing about gender and it doesn't really matter if it's a woman or if it's a man, but I think that that is a, um, a specific thing that she has done in some ways to, to, to push the idea of gender out of the, out of the story, which is really, I think, laudable. Uh, but there is an identification or an assumption that the reader makes in the beginning with the last name. And it's very interesting to think about the way that yellow face would look if it were written by someone who's white. So you have this, um, you know, already we're kind of playing with this idea of who it is who's writing, who it is who's telling the story, who is being sort of um, disguised by these literary details. It's really interesting and thought provoking. Okay. So now we're going to move on to the next page here. So she's talking about how nobody likes Athena because Athena has everything. But then on page two, but in recent years, I've developed another theory, which is that everyone else finds her as unbearable as I do. It's hard, after all, to be friends with someone who outshines you at every term. Probably no one else can stand Athena because they can't stand constantly failing to measure up to her. Probably I'm here because I'm just that pathetic. It's interesting because I'm here is one of these. It's a, is one of these things where we we have this idea that she something has happened. I mean, she's here at this point in time telling this story in the first person because of some events and you know this this sense that she might be pathetic. So we were reminded in a very subtle and very cool way on page two that that a bunch of things are going to unfold about. Athena and June. And June is in this position at the end because she might be pathetic. One thing I think is interesting is this, this whole paragraph about how that she has this new theory and it might be that other people are finding Athena, you know, uh, like unbearable. But then she basically goes on to say the same thing that Athena has everything. Like she's, her, her, June's whole problem is that she cannot measure up. So it's all this competitive stuff, um, which really makes that uh, part in the acknowledgments ring true, the idea about this being a very, very competitive industry and this essentially being a, a kind of a horror story. Um, so then um, we have this paragraph here on page two, which is very important. So that night, it's only Athena and me at a loud, overpriced rooftop bar in Georgetown. She's flinging back cocktails like she has a duty to prove she's having a good time, and I'm drinking to dull the bitch in me that wishes she were dead. So this is so sly. It's so good on the part of our author because right at the beginning, she's admitting that she's a bitch and any kind of admission of, of guilt or of feeling badly or contrition, all of that uh, makes us have sympathy. So there are subtle ways in the beginning that we're like, oh, she's, you know, she feels badly about what she's done. So we have sympathy for her. We don't know what happened yet. I mean, we do from the, the flap copy which says, in fact, that Athena is about to die. So we also have this thing here where she's wishing she were dead, and we know, in fact, she's going to die soon. So there's this nice, um, it, it's a very sort of intricate, but very subtle and very sort of straightforward, uh, but very provocative way to open the book. Now we're going to dive into a little more about this narrative voice and how really, really well done it is all throughout the novel. So uh, we talked about it in the very beginning. One of the important things I want to, to underscore, though, about the beginning is that when you have um, a, a narrator who is telling their story, there is this idea of, of there can be all sorts of self-delusion. You know, this person can believe what they're saying and they can believe that they're in the right and, you know, they can try to convince us of that. 
But it is really interesting the way that self-delusion, you know, they can be telling us things that are incorrect or things that are just severely biased because they are speaking, you know, their truth. They're speaking their own uh, sort of point of view and their own impressions. Okay, so we're going to look at page 36 and 7. This is a very important moment when she is, uh, when our author is helping our narrator really garner some, some support and some sympathy. And this is kind of like, I think it's like a legal thing where you essentially try to, uh, you know, like tear apart your uh, opponent's, um, you know, defense before they make it. Um, by the way, uh, apparently Rebecca Kwong is like incredibly, incredibly good at debate and like, like has won all of these awards and everything. So you can understand why this narrator's defense of herself and the way that she's kind of garnering our sympathy and our understanding and seeming contrite, the way all of that is happening and the way it's all structured and laid out is um, really, really well done in part because of this history of, of debate and, and logic and argument uh, and rhetoric. So on 36, it's chapter three, and it opens like this, what June says, I know what you're thinking, thief, plagiarizer, and perhaps, because all bad things must be racially motivated, racist. Hear me out, it's not so awful as it sounds. So we have this idea, she's like, okay, I get it. This is what you're thinking about me. And, uh, you know, I, like I understand that, but now I'm gonna explain it to you. So all of our sort of assumptions that have been brewing are now um, being named by her and then presumably she's gonna go through and, and defend herself. Plagiarism is an easy way out, the way you cheat when you can't string words together on your own. But what I did was not easy. I did rewrite most of the book. So this is this idea she's convincing herself and she's beginning to convince us, or at least trying to, that, that sort of publishing the book under her own name was fine because it was essentially a collaboration or that she really strengthened it so much that it is, um, you know, that she, it would not have been a success if Athena published it, but after June's help, that is why it is successful. So then on page 38, is that justification enough for you or are you still convinced that I'm some racist thief? Fine, here's how I really felt when things came down to it. At Yale, I once dated a graduate student in the philosophy department who did population ethics. He wrote papers on thought experiments so implausible that I often thought he would have been better off writing for science fiction which I really love that because, um, you know, she does, Rebecca does some of that. So there's this idea of poking fun at philosophy and at, at um, possibility and science fiction and fantasy um, that I really enjoy. Uh, but more to the point here, um, what's happening now is she's like, okay, whatever, you think I'm a thief and a racist, but now I'm going to really hit you with like the, the sort of really compelling argument. And here it is. The general theme of his research was under what circumstances someone counts as a moral agent that deserves consideration. I didn't understand much of his work, but his central argument was quite compelling. We owe nothing to the dead. Especially when the dead are thieves and liars too. And fuck it, I'll just say it. Taking Athena's manuscript felt like reparations. Payback for the things that Athena took from me. So this is a book that is very tense and it is really this delicious tension that she's building all the time. That's the end of a, um, of a chapter there talking about like, okay, fine, I'll admit it. I took these things from her and uh, A, she was dead. So she didn't really deserve any more, um, you know, like she didn't deserve any more real consideration, but also there's some sort of payback that Athena essentially owes her something. It's so strong. So we're building sympathy as we go here. And then we are going to look next on page 54. And this is one of the most egregious parts uh, of, of like the book, I think, which is when um, June goes and visits Athena's mother. Um, importantly, the, the name Athena is so interesting because, you know, Athena was born from Zeus's forehead. This is kind of idea of, of I mean, she's the goddess of wisdom and war, but there's this idea of her as being born sort of whole. So you have this idea of, of creation and this idea of kind of not immaculate conception, but like this idea of, of something coming just like a thunderbolt. So you have this idea uh, uh, that here that Athena has, has created this manuscript and then it is essentially being stolen. I also love the idea of her being uh, the goddess of war and wisdom. So here she is with the mother of Athena. I mean, this part is so gnarly. On 54, 
but those notebooks are her original thoughts, raw and filtered. And I just can't help but, I don't know, I feel like donating them to an archive would be a violation, like putting her corpse on display. And then a little further down, of course it's up to you, I say hastily. It's entirely your right to do as you like with them. I just thought as a friend, I feel obligated to tell you, I don't think that's what Athena would have wanted. I see. Mrs. Lou's eyes are red, watery with tears. Thank you, June. I never even considered. She's silent for a moment, staring at her teacup. She blinks hard, then glances up at me. Do you want them then? It's so good. So this is one of those kind of darkly comic moments. Like the timing here is so good. I mean, the reason she wants the manuscripts is so that she's not going to get caught. If Athena's work is, um, you know, is, is all of this stuff about the novel that June has now passed off as her own, obviously June's going to be in real trouble. So here we have this, um, th this moment where she realizes she has to get all of Athena's papers and she's so conniving and terrible. I mean, this was really one of those moments where I was like, wow, she is not a great person. Then on page 76, this was a big moment for me in the book because I literally have written here, if you're on YouTube, I'm showing you my marginalia. It says, um, this is in my handwriting, maybe we are supposed to dislike her which is so funny. Like, I mean, obviously we're supposed to be disliking her a little bit, um, but, but there is this sense, I was so shocked by that because again, most of the time a, a writer wants you to like the person. I mean, honestly, did I like Humbert Humbert more than I like her? I don't know. That's kind of a hard question, but, but I, I really, um, I really dislike this woman at this point for sure. I mean, I, I really disliked Humbert Humbert too, to be clear in Lolita. So we have on page 76 here, June at this point is getting uh, one of the people who work on her publishing team. She's getting her fired because this woman, Candace, is, uh, is, is suspicious. So the editor is very angry about Candace and is going to, we assume, is going to fire Candace. And this is how June reacts to this idea. Good. Hot vindication coils in my gut. Candace deserves it. Putting the sensitivity read kerfuffle aside, what kind of psychopath would fuck around with an author's feeling like this? That's when I was like, wait, we're not supposed to like her. I mean, at this point, she's really acting pretty sociopathically. Uh, we are 76 pages in. She's already done the weird thing with the mom. We're beginning to find that she actually is really uh, up to no good. And this idea of um, what kind of a psychopath would fuck around with an author's feelings like this, I mean that is a, like so self-delusional and so kind of unself-aware that apparently that was the first point in the book where I was like, maybe we're not supposed to like her. Sometimes I think I'm such a naive uh, reader. So then she goes on, things get worse from there. Shouldn't she know how stressful and terrifying it is to launch a book? I mean, cry me a river. That's, that's my voice, not what they have in here. I mean, come on, like launching a book is, yeah, I mean, sure, I guess it's stressful, but what, what a privilege, what a joy. I bask for a moment imagining what kind of chaos I've sown over at Eden's office this morning. And though I would never say this out loud about a fellow woman, the industry is tough enough as it is, I hope I got that bitch fired. I mean, it is so good. And partially it's good because she's like, I would never say this, but then she just goes ahead and says it to us the reader. So um, I think pretty decisively at the bottom of 76, we should in fact begin to really dislike her. So I want to do something briefly here, which is to look back a little bit at how sympathy has been garnered at this point. It's a little tricky when you have first person to get um, sort of outside visions of the narrator. Essentially, like you have to have other people who are somehow, um, you know, talking about this person and, and they can't often be talking to that person. It's very tricky tricky business to get sort of outside views. And she does it so, so well. So we're going to look at page 24. So this is obviously, we're going back fairly far in the book. This was um, when, when Athena dies in front of her and, you know, her sister is, is logically afraid that maybe this was traumatic for June, which in fact is very ironic because it probably was, I mean, we know it was a little traumatic because she has these kind of flashbacks about how horrible it was when uh, Athena was actually dying. But in fact, she sort of parlayed the tragedy into a real opportunity for herself. This is when our June is having kind of a hard time. So she's talking to her sister, Rory. Are you going to be okay? Rory presses. Do you want me to call Dr. Gailey? No, God, no, I'm fine. Don't call Dr. Gailey. 
okay, it's just, she told us that if you were ever backsliding, I'm not backsliding, I take a deep breath. This isn't like that, I'm all right, Rory. I don't know Athena that well anyway, it's fine. So there's a certain irony here, but more importantly, we know in fact that June has a history of some sort of psychiatric problem because this idea of backsliding and this idea of having a doctor and one who is on call, and in fact one who has spoken with the family and you know let them know that if, if she is having problems, if June is having problems that the family should alert her. So you have this sense like, oh no, like this is this is someone who is troubled. And there's like kind of a, a an old saw in writing, which is that if you want your readers to love a character, show them their vulnerabilities. So that this is, I think, showing us one of her vulnerabilities. And in fact, I do think it's fairly effective uh, at garnering some sympathy for her even while she's behaving so badly. But again, that was on page 24, and, and she just seems to be getting kind of worse and worse. Um, we're going to look at page 138. This is another example of when uh, when we have some sympathy for her. And again, you know, the sort of natural stance for most readers is to, to have sympathy for a character. So it's really helpful um, that as we are gaining an appreciation for how kind of awful she is, there are also moments where we are really developing some sympathy. So on 138, why in God's name did I publish the last front? I want to kick my former self for being so stupid. I thought I was doing something good, something noble, to bring Athena's work into the world the way it deserved. But how could I ever have imagined this wouldn't all come back to bite me in the ass? Okay, couple things. One, my marginalia there is like, really? Like, I don't believe her. Um, but but you're also like, okay, well, at least she's, so, you know, she's showing some signs of contrition. But this idea of it coming back to bite me in the ass, like the fact that those are her choice of words, you're like, okay, that doesn't really sound like she's that broken up about it. It sounds like she's worried and 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 sort of cynical and a little, a little tough. Um, and then down a little further, oh God, what have I done? My phone, face up on my bed, keeps flashing blue with new notifications. They look like alarm sirens. I burst into wails, loud and ugly, wanton like a toddler's. My own volume frightens me. I'm scared my neighbors will hear, so I turn my face into my pillow, and that's how I stay, muffled and hysterical, for hours. Then a little further down, we have just this one line where she says, oh God, what have I done? So there's this idea here of, of, of you know, maybe some actual contrition, and then she's sobbing and sobbing. And so you do, um, again, you have a little bit of a sense of some sort of sympathy because she is showing some sort of contrition. So one of the very cool things that you can often have uh, when you have a first person narrator is this idea of dramatic irony. So in this case, dramatic irony, it sounds kind of uh, confusing, but it's very simple. Dramatic irony is just this idea that we as readers have information that the narrator uh, or the characters in the story don't have. So when we know a certain thing is happening and the, the narrator is not aware of that, it's really delicious. And this first person narrator, um, it, it's sometimes tricky to have dramatic irony, but it's really well done when it does work. And part of it's that like we as readers, we know what she has done. We know that she watched Athena die. We know she stole the manuscript. So as that, you know, her lies are catching up to her and she's having these conversations defending herself, we as readers are like, um, that's not true. So on page 141, this is when, um, you know, the, the, the illusion is beginning to crumble. That is a totally mixed metaphor. That's terrible. This is when the illusion is beginning to fade. No, um, it's beginning to fall apart. It's beginning to lose its cohesion. Um, at this point, the illusion is it's not working as well for her anymore. And people are starting to, uh, you know, on social media, on Twitter, on these different platforms, people are starting to call uh, for, for some justice, for, for Juniper Song, in fact, to admit that she stole Athena's work. So on 141, uh, one of the, the people she works with on her PR team, I think, is, is telling her it's not a problem. Just relax, June. You're going to get some haters. It comes with the territory. If it's not true, then you have nothing to worry about. Brett pauses for a moment. I mean, it's not true, is it? No, God, of course not. Then block and ignore them, Brett snorts, or better yet, block Twitter altogether. You writers are too online to begin with. This will blow over. These things always do. 
So again, this is so delightful as the narrator, I mean, as a reader, because you're like, oh my gosh, wait, this is not so simple. It's not going to blow over. We also, you know, the ease with which she is lying to him, we also are not wild about. Like she has a lot of different times when she could come clean and she's not doing it, um, which of course is good fiction, uh, but it but it does not make us like her anymore. Okay, and then one more example of dramatic irony on 278. So this is when really uh, her, her editorial team is asking her some difficult questions. And again, we as readers are like, oh, there's all sorts of dramatic irony because we know the truth. And we're like, how is she going to get out of this? So her main editor or agent, I can't remember, Daniela, is saying this. I don't think that will be necessary, says Daniela. What about the last front then? Is that completely original? Guys, my voice hitches. Come on, you know me. Which is a total non-answer. I mean, that's just not, she's not saying one way or the other. I mean, it's really uh, deft and also, you know, bordering on the sociopathic. Then Daniela says this, you can tell us, says Daniela, we're on your team. If there was any sort of collaboration or anything that means you are not the sole author, we need to know. So you're like, oh my gosh, okay, here you go. You can say it. And then um, as we go down a little further, Hold on, I cut in. No, look, I swear to God, it's mine. The project is mine. I wrote out every single word myself. And that was true, completely true. I made the last front. Athena's version was utterly unpublishable. That book exists because of me. Do you possibly have proof of that? Todd asks. Early drafts, perhaps, emails with timestamps that we could verify. So she's getting herself more and more into hot water. But this is such an interesting passage because. When she says, I wrote out every single word of it myself, I mean, yes, she wrote out every single word. And that little inclusion of out, I wrote out every word, is so different than I wrote every word. So she's trying to convince not only herself and the reader and her editorial team, um, but it's done in this very sort of subtle grammatic way that most readers, I think, would probably pick up on that, but it certainly uh, was a glaring little tiny word there. So in the part two about um, how it, it, this was completely true, I made the last front, it was utterly unpublishable, none of that is in quotation marks. So we have the part that she's saying to everyone, which is that she wrote out every word, and then the rest of that is meant to be really, I think, um, you know, convincing herself. Also, you know, at this point, I don't think we are even remotely convinced, but maybe, you know, maybe you have this idea, like maybe she edited it so thoroughly that it's really an entirely different book. So it's a really interesting interesting and really great way to keep this question alive. I mean, we're almost, you know, what, we're 250 pages into the book and we are still, you know, asking some pretty, pretty serious questions here about what is uh, ethical in terms of authorship. So examples of unreliable narrators are always a little squishy. I mean, there's kind of a fine line between just trying to, you know, convince us of something or, or, or um, you know, drumming up sympathy. But I, I think this is a pretty good example of, of us being sort of led down the garden path a little bit. On 278, she's talking to Athena's friend, Jeff, and uh, we, she, she sort of is, is like insinuating that maybe Athena is still alive. You don't think I trailed off what? That it's her? Jeff pauses. He's also had suspicions, I can tell. It's crazy, but I wouldn't put it past Athena to fake her own death, to put the manuscript right, right where she knew I would find it. The funeral could have been staged. Her mom could be in on it. Maybe she's watching from the wings right now, laughing into her trench coat. So you have this idea here of, of her kind of like really uh, getting a little bit too invested in uh, the idea of this whole story that she is spinning out in a way um, where we are becoming more and more uh, convinced that she is not, in fact, a reliable narrator. But there is this question, we're going to get to the idea of this book as, as a sort of a horror story. There is this question of like, who is this person in the scarf? So you're like, I don't, like, we, we know that Athena died earlier. Maybe, could she have faked her death? Like, there's a teeny, teeny part of you as a reader, maybe, um, who is, is questioning. And it's really, really to Kwang's um, credit that at this point in the book, we're still like, I, maybe, maybe, is there actually a ghost? Like, how can there actually be a ghost? I, you know, those of you who are a little bit more plot oriented and a little more invested in figuring out what's going on, you may have guessed long before I did um, who the person is, who is, um, you know, this kind of ghost figure. I, as always in mysteries, I just was like, oh my God, like, 
super surprised when the whole thing is revealed. So um, most of you, I think, probably probably were a couple steps ahead of me on that one. It's not really my forte, the whole like mystery and figuring these things out. Okay, the last two things we're going to look at briefly is this humor. I have a couple of quick examples. Then we're going to look at horror uh, and then uh, some politics of identity, and we will conclude. So looking at humor on page 17, this is, um, speaking of feathers in people's caps, this is really well done because this is actually the horrible scene when Athena is dying, but there is so much levity and so much dark humor in it uh, that it's a real credit uh, to our author here. So she realizes she's choking. Heimlich. I know the Heimlich. At least I think I do. I haven't thought about it since grade school but I get behind her and wrap my arms around her waist and I jerk my hands against her stomach, which should dislodge the pancake. Holy shit, she's skinny. But she's still shaking her head, tapping my arm. It's not coming out. I jerk it again and again. This isn't working. It crosses my mind to pull out my phone to Google Heimlich. Maybe watch a YouTube tutorial, but there's no time. That'll take forever. So I, I mean, gosh, there are a few things that I really love about this. First of all, she hasn't thought about it since grade school. It's kind of reiterating how young these people are. I mean, they have had a lot of success, but they're very young people. And then um, this idea of, of she starts doing this Heimlich, and then there's an M dash, which is my favorite punctuation mark, and this, this little clause in the M dash when she says, um, holy shit, she's skinny. This holy shit, she's skinny thing, it's so irreverent, but it's also like something that you might, it, like all of these things might cross your mind. You might be like, wait, I should, I should Google how to do the Heimlich maneuver, or wow, she's so skinny. Like when you, it's a very intimate thing, you know, to grab someone around their rib cage. So these things that are happening are somewhat relatable. They're also absurd. And there's a certain um, irreverence here, this like, holy shit, she's skinny. And shit in that sense is, um, in that case is italicized. So you have this real um, sense again of some sort of comedic thing happening. Okay, the next example of comedy is on page 73. This really killed me because it has to do with publishing and I am a real sucker for anything that happens in the publishing world, having having dipped a toe into that world. So this is when uh, th the book has just come out. The good news keeps piling up. Brett emails me with updates on foreign rights sales. We've sold rights in Germany, Spain, Poland, and Russia. Not France yet, but we're working on it, says Brett. But nobody sells well in France. If the French like you, then you're doing something very wrong. I love that so much because, um, as you all know, my degree is in Spanish and French literature, and I love reading in French. I don't even know what, why. I don't know why. Um, turns out I'm actually in the same maternal haplog group as Marie Antoinette, which is so funny to me because I learned that from 23andMe, and I got really excited about it. And then it turns out that like one in 500 people is like in her haplog group. It also does not mean that I am a descendant of her because she did not have any children. It just means that we're like in some sort of genetic group together. But I have often wondered why it is that my brain is so happy reading both Spanish and French. Um, and I, I don't know. I think there's something very deep in there, something that I don't fully understand. I really, really love it. So this idea of like, if the French like you, you're really doing something wrong. I mean, a lot of French writing is obscure and interesting and experimental, um, but I just thought that was so, so funny. And that that's a kind of humor, like that's kind of out there. It's a little bit less um, kind of on the nose. Um, and it's this really great cultural uh, uh, commentary that I really enjoyed. Okay, the next example of humor is on uh, page 140. So this is, again, um, when, when people are starting to have a lot of opinions about the book. One of the people on our team says, so let them form opinions. Eden's not going to take the book off the shelves on the basis of some internet gossip. And most customers don't have their eyes glued to Twitter. Trust me, it's a very small fraction of publishing that's going to care. I make a gross whining noise. My reputation with that fraction matters, though. So what I thought was so funny there is I make a gross whining noise because there, there's, again, like a certain comedic element here. Like it's not all just like heavy and she's really terrified. It's like she's making a gross noise. It's kind of like when she's like, holy shit, like th there's a certain irreverence there. And there's also like a little bit of um, self-awareness in that that I thought was funny and kind of charming and just like a different kind of texture uh, and, and really one that I liked. Um, and then down a little further, though, she says, Brett yammers on for a bit longer, citing examples of other famous authors who have been targets of online hate campaigns. That was one of those times where I was like, 
sociopath also ha ha because um this idea of Brett yammers on like he's really working hard to help her but she's not hearing it because she knows in fact it will not be helpful because she knows in fact that she is guilty and our final example of humor on 287 this is kind of a um a, like a little bit of a send up and, and it's certainly poking fun uh, at white people at this point june is fully convinced that she is being haunted by a ghost and is trying to figure out ways to exercise the ghost and and it she's, she knows she's grasping at straws here like she definitely knows that this is kind of a crazy thing to be doing and the passage about it i thought was was pretty funny so down at the bottom of 287. But the normal methods of dispelling ghosts, the ones that work in all the other stories, seem insufficient. I doubt Athena will be happy with offerings of food, incense, or burnt paper, which isn't to say I don't try. Deep down I know it's stupid, but I'm desperate enough to hope the rituals might at least calm my mind. I order incense sticks on Amazon, which that part's so funny. Like, it's so kind of un- um, like spiritual and like, I mean, you know, this is not like getting a Catholic priest to exercise someone, which importantly at the end, I thought that was such a cool tie-in because this idea of exercising the ghost, um, you know, the, the priest in The Exorcist dies on the steps in, uh, in Washington, D.C., where June eventually falls uh, when she's being caught out at the very end. So you have these kind of nice, um, you know, tie-ins of the exorcism here. But she says the following. I order incense sticks on Amazon and Kung Pao chicken from kitchen number one, I mean that is awful, and place both before the framed photo of Athena, but all it does is stink up my apartment. Which there, I'm like, I hope she's talking about the, uh, the incense, because whatever, like if she thinks Chinese food stinks, then there's really something wrong with her, also culturally insensitive. There is that other part where she meets with a group of older Asian women and she doesn't like what they're eating. And again, it just seems so insensitive and so disrespectful. So, you know, things are piling up. Even as we think she's funny, we're also like, wow, she is really pretty terrible. I print paper cutouts of all the things I imagine Athena could want in the underworld. Stacks of money, a lavish apartment, the entire Ikea catalog, and light them up with a match. But that only sets off the fire alarm, which pisses off my neighbors and lands me with a hefty fine. I don't feel better. I feel like a meme of a clueless white person. So this is like, honestly, I think a lot of the genius of this book, um, sort of one of the keys to it is this idea of, of uh, Kwong being really good at rhetoric and really good at argument. Because we know, I mean, as this, as our June here is doing all of these ridiculous things, you know, we as readers are like, oh my God, she is such a like clueless white person. Like this all just seems so inappropriate and insensitive. But the fact that she is acknowledging it, the fact that she knows that about herself and has a certain amount of self uh, awareness allows us to see her as a somewhat rounded character and not just as some kind of straw man that, you know, is built up in order to be, you know, a joke. So it's really, um, I think, very, very deftly done and, and takes a lot of skill, uh, which, I mean, Kwong is obviously, obviously very skilled. Okay, I want to talk briefly about this idea of this book being kind of a horror story. And again, she says, uh, you know, it's, it's essentially a horror story about loneliness, which is really compelling. And I especially that idea about loneliness as being central for June, it really um, adds some, some pathos and, and some, she is a very lonely person. Like she just has very few people in her life. So this idea of loneliness as compelling her to do all these terrible things is, is a compelling idea. But even as early as page 82, we have this idea that we are reading, in fact, a ghost story. So on 82, um, it's actually so well done. She is giving like a book talk and it's really going well. And um, in fact, at the end of a, uh, a paragraph here, it says, I'm going completely off the cuff now, and every word out of my mouth is clever, adorable, engaging. I'm killing it. And then I see her. So the fact that she says, I'm killing it, is so eerie. You know, it's like this, I mean, obviously, you're like, oh, I, you know, I killed it, or whatever, I'm murdering, or whatever. Um, but, but this idea of I'm killing it, and then the next thing is, and then I see her, there is this real sense about her having brought Athena's demise upon her. And then um, it gets creepier. And then I see her. Right there in the front row, flesh and blood, casting her own shadow, so solid and present that I can't be hallucinating. She's dressed in an emerald green shawl, one of her signature looks, looped over her slender frame in such a way that makes her shoulders look thin, 
vulnerable, and elegant all at once. She slouched gracefully against her plastic pull-out chair, pushing her shiny black locks over her shoulders, Athena. I mean, this is a little creepy, but then it's very important to also understand that this is a terrible moment in the book because it is really playing on this trope that white people have a hard time distinguishing Asian people. So this is not Athena, and later it turns out that we know who, in fact, this is, but the fact that she cannot distinguish someone who is her friend is really appalling, and it's, it, it goes kind of unremarked, and you just are like, when you, when you kind of realize that, it's really, really kind of upsetting. Um, so you have this this real sense of, uh, obviously, of racism here. And this is one of the things that, that starts plaguing her more and more, these accusations of racism. Um, we're going to look at the next uh, bit of the horror part. On 274, you know, this is, this is almost 200 pages later. Oh my god, my math is so bad. Um, yes, it's almost you know, what, 190 pages later. So we need kind of a reminder of that first sighting of what is this kind of ghost-like figure. And so we do have this nice reminder. A memory rises unbidden to my mind's eye, a memory that I'd hoped I'd drowned out or forgotten. Athena in her black boots and green shawl, sitting in the front row of the audience at politics and prose, beaming expectantly at me with bright painted lips. Athena, inexplicably, impossibly alive. Uh, I have to take one quick second here and tell you that I really, really hate the use of impossibly like that. That is an adverb that every single hipster novel, every single, like everything, God, I get to the place of every single novel that I love and someone will have used impossibly as an adverb. And I'm just like, oh my God, please do not do that. It's always gratuitous. It never really works for me. And it's so like of the moment although it's been like 10 years now that people have been doing this, it drives me insane. Every time, if I edit it out, uh, it makes for a stronger sentence. I'm, sometimes I do that. Sometimes I do a little bit of uh, you know editing as I am reading. So we have this idea of having our memory jogged that she uh, did see this kind of ghost and really was convinced it was maybe Athena. Okay, so then we're going to go on to the next horror part, which is on page 290. I'm writing in a booth at Saxby's one afternoon when a flash of emerald green catches my eye. I look up through the window and see her, windswept locks floating around her face, staring right back at me. She's wearing the same shawl, the same high-heeled boots. Is this not proof she is a ghost? The living change clothes, do they not? The dead stay the same. Okay, first of all, this is such a ridiculous thing because they're staring right at each other and still our, our June here cannot distinguish between uh, this person and her friend Athena. So that's one problem. We also have this idea that um, that just the fact that the, uh, that the outfit is the same, I mean, it's a little creepy. Like I was a little bit creeped out. I was like, wow, what's, I wasn't creeped out wasn't like afraid. Uh, but I was also like, I wonder how she's going to spin this out. Like, are we meant to believe this is actually some sort of haunting? Or are we going to uh, have a more logical kind of earthly explanation? And it is, of course, the latter. And obviously, if, uh, you know, this person is trying to scare her by being this ghost, it is, in fact, logical that that person would wear the same clothes. I also love the idea of the really, um, the, the like heavily painted lip, because look at this author photo that is in the back of the book. So you see this teal and this dark lipstick here on our author. Again, there's a certain amount of kind of overlap between uh, Rebecca Kwan and Athena Lou. So I really, um, I like that. I like that little nod to the teal because it is in fact the author photo that is in the back of the book. But you know, things are getting a little bit creepier. We are now looking at uh, 299. This is when they, they are meeting because she's really paranoid now and is sure that in Athena in fact is alive. And so we hear this, uh, this voice when they meet together on the exorcist steps. It's Athena. That's undoubtedly Athena's voice, affecting that disinterested, so transparently artificial it's ironic, which makes it real, Timber. I've heard her employed dozens of times on radio interviews and podcasts. So the careful reader there is thinking, um, okay, wait, if this is her voice from uh, radio and podcasts, then this is obviously how uh, our 
um, our revenge person is making this happen. So you understand that a recording is being played of Athena's voice, but June is still, um, you know, freaking out and our person who is out for revenge will have some sort of revenge. So then, of course, this ghost-like figure is what, in fact, brings the whole thing kind of falling down around uh around June when she falls down and then we as readers and June herself knows that you know the gig is up or the jig the jig is up I don't know and that in fact uh, she is going to be caught. I want to talk very briefly about some really deft ways that Kwong is is really pointing out a lot of the sort of politics of identity that the book brings up and then we're going to look at the clothes. So there are a bunch of different places where she's really very clearly um, talking about the experiences that these different people are bringing to it. And one of them is so egregious and terrible. On page 307, really toward the end of the book, things are really winding up. And June just is having this conversation with Candace that is so cringy. So here we go. Uh, June speaks first. Can't you understand what it was like, I beg, even a little bit? Athena had fucking everything. It wasn't fair. Is that how you justify it? But it's true, isn't it? Athena had made it. You people, I mean, diverse people, you're all they want, which is so bad. I mean, this whole, like, you people, like, it's so insensitive and so awful. And, you know, she then is quickly saying, like, oh, all you diversity people, which is still so awful. Like, she's just digging herself deeper and deeper. You're all they want. And then this is so great. Oh my God. Candace presses a palm against her forehead. You really are insane. Do all white people talk like this? It's true, I insist. I'm just the only one who saw it. And it's actually tempting there. I mean, as a country, we're having some really difficult discussions about things like affirmative action and things like trying to like level the playing field. But I think there are people who have this idea that June is articulating, which is like, oh, it's so much easier for everyone who's not white now to tell their story because all anybody wants to hear are stories from people who are not white. I think that is a, it's a feeling that people have. I think it's personally, I think it's ridiculous. White people are still uh, really dominating the conversation and white people have had a long, long time to tell their story. And it's really important to listen to many other voices who are finally, you know, being able to tell their story. But then it's so good. Again, this is that amazing rhetoric that Kwong, I think, is so good at. Is she then kind of uh, pulls apart that argument um, in, in the voice of Candace here? Do you know how much shit Athena got from this industry? Candace demands. They marked her as their token exotic Asian girl. Every time she tried to branch out to new projects, they kept insisting that Asian was her brand, was what her audience expected. They never let her talk about anything other than being an immigrant, other than the fact that half her family died in Cambodia, that her dad killed himself on the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen. Racial trauma sells, right? They treated her like a museum object. That was her marketing point, being a Chinese tragedy. She leaned into it too. She knew the rules. She fucking milked it for all it was worth. So it is so good and so rounded. Candace is also, you know, jealous of what's going on here, but also really sees very clearly how awful it would be to be pigeonholed and to be, and to be you know, this kind of token representative of, uh, you know, a, a group of people who are myriad. I mean, just... It's so well done the way that these very thorny topics are being played out in these two characters. Okay, and then um, a little further beyond that, this is when it gets kind of meta. So one of the things that is beginning to take shape here, and in fact, it, it first is mentioned um, quite a few pages ago on page 266, um, there's a, an email when all the shit starts going down and it's clear that in fact, June will not be able to get away with this, uh, you know, this kind of plagiarism that she's doing. And there's a nod at the end of one of the emails uh, from the publishing team that says, I'd pay to read a novel about that whole mess itself. So you get this idea in this kind of meta thing, because of course, the novel about the mess itself is the novel we are holding in our hands. But you have this idea that like, wait a minute, like the real story here is not The Last Front. The real story here is this novel um, that is the story of the plagiarism and Athena's death. 
and all of these different issues of of ownership and and plagiarism and uh, and racism. So then we have these kind of more pointed um, uh, comments that I just love. I eat this stuff up. On three oh eight, Candace says, "Can you imagine how they'll fawn over this?" She spreads her hands in the air like she's tracing out a rainbow. Yellow face by Candace Lee, and then down a little further. And this is our this is now our narrator June talking. It all boils down to self-interest, manipulating the story, gaining the upper hand, doing whatever it takes. If publishing is rigged, you might as well make sure it's rigged in your favor. I get it. I've done it too. It's just playing the game. It's how you survive in this industry. If I were in Candace's shoes right now, if I had the same kind of narrative gold she's carrying in her backpack, of course I'd do the same. So good. So here we have this idea like, okay, Candace has got this story, but also June understands the pressures, the jealousy, all of that. And then we have an even grosser articulation of this idea by, uh, by June. Ever since The Last Front came out, I have been victim to people like Candace and Diana and Adele, people who think that just because they're oppressed and marginalized, they can do or say whatever they want that the world should put them on a pedestal and shower them with opportunities, that reverse racism is okay, that they can bully, harass, and humiliate people like me just because I'm white, just because that counts as punching up, because in this day and age, women like me are the last acceptable target. Racism is bad, but you can still send death threats to Karens. So I kind of um, love the idea of Karens, but I also really think this is just, I mean, I have, I have to say again, I have so many Karens in my life and I love all of them. But this idea that that somehow white women are um, lampoonable, I think is actually a very um, strong idea. I think it's true. I think a lot of what white women do is ridiculous. I think a lot of what white women do is also amazing. I mean, you know, you can lampoon all sorts of things. But what's happening here is June is really articulating a position that a lot of people feel. And this, to me, is when it gets very interesting. So this is this idea um, that, that we need to take a step back and look at the fact that this book is being written by someone who is Asian. So she is having, um, we have this, this Asian woman who is telling this story of a white woman who is, is, is articulating all of these racist things in, in these arguments that I think a lot of people believe in, this idea of this sort of idea that it's easier to be published or to get a job these days if you are not white, which honestly is just not, I, I mean, I think many, many studies and statistics prove that that is not in fact the case. And we have some really great articulation in here by people like Candace of how difficult um, even those kind of successes are for people who are not white in the workplace or in the publishing world. So we have these really complicated, uh, really like important, really inflammatory issues that are being so well articulated here. So we're gonna look at the very end of the novel, but it's important to think about this politics of like, um, you know, Candace could probably also get away with the book that says Yellow Face, but it would be a whole different thing if Kimberly Ford, you know, was was trying to write this story and, and have any sort of sympathy for this white woman who is, in fact, being really awful and who has done something totally unethical. But I loved the ending of the book. We're going to look just uh, very briefly at the close. So this is 318 and 319. I'll spend the next eight weeks scribbling down all my thoughts and recollections. I can't recycle material from my pseudo-autobiography. No, in that project, I was willing to make myself the villain for the sake of entertainment. In this version, I need redemption. I must make them see my side of the story. Athena was the leech, the vampire, the ghost who wouldn't let me go. Candace, her deranged wannabe proxy. So I love the ending. So we know that in the beginning, you know, she begins with this, I did this, and you have to understand a few things about Athena. So we have this idea that she is the one who's writing it. And she there's this kind of uncanny cool thing here uh, where she talks about her, um, you know, this idea of, of uh, sympathy and, and who is the villain and that kind of thing. So she says, in that project, I was willing to make myself the villain for the sake of entertainment. In this version, I need redemption. I must make them see my side of the story. Athena was the leech, the vampire, the ghost who wouldn't let me go. Candace, her deranged wannabe proxy. I am innocent. My only sin is loving literature too much. 
and refusing to let Athena's very prenatal work go to waste. Down a bit further, a year later, I'll be in bookstores everywhere. The initial press coverage will be skeptical at best, scathing at worst. White Lady publishes Tell All. June Hayward writes the memoir none of us wanted because this psycho just can't stop. Diana Q will blow a gasket. Adele Sparksada will lose her fucking mind. But some reviewer somewhere will give the book a closer look. They'll publish a contrarian review because editors who want clickbait always solicit contrarian views. What if we got it all wrong? And that's all it takes to sow doubt. The netizens who love to argue for the sake of arguing will look for the holes in Candace's story. The character assassinations will begin. We'll all get dragged down in the mud, and when the dust clears, all that will remain is the question, what if Juniper Song was right? And this will become, in time, my story once again. So I love this so much. This question at the end um, is interesting, but this idea of this will become in time my story once again is so strong because it really is asking us to think about whose story this is. I mean, it is Rebecca Kwan's, you know, it's not her autobiography, but we feel like a lot of it is borrowed from her own personal experiences and we're meant to sort of lean into that idea. And we really have this important idea about who gets to tell their story story and who gets to tell other people's stories, it's a really provocative question th that I think is so deftly handled. Mostly, though, I want to end with uh, the idea that this book is so readable and it is so funny and so dark and so um, compelling, and it has so much um, really expert construction and it really brings us to all of these different places. So I hope that you have enjoyed this dive into Yellow Face. It's just such an accomplishment and it was so rewarding to really dig into. So thank you for listening. And uh, if you're done, get yourself back to the Fox page and find something else to listen to. Happy reading.